Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Joseph Cotton in tonight's presentation of Suspense. One hundred years ago, this week, a group of brave men risked their lives in a desperate effort to save their fellow men. Tonight, Autolite honors this centennial with a dramatic recreation of their attempted Arctic rescue. Our star, Mr. Joseph Cotton. Hey, Harlow, what's in the package? Ah, the world's best Christmas present, Hap. Oh, for whom? My car. It's an Autolite stay-full battery, the famous battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Oh, that sure is a real present. Right, you are, Hap. The Autolite stay-full is always a real present for every car and every car owner because money just can't buy a better battery. Why, the Autolite stay-full has fiberglass retaining mats protecting every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Where can I find this famous battery, Hilo? Under the hoods of millions of cars and at your Autolite battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries, and you can quickly locate him by looking for the Autolite battery sign or just call Western Union by number... And ask for Operator 25. I'll gladly tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer where you can get an Autolite staple. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents a dramatic recreation of Arctic Rescue, starring Joseph Cotton, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Picture this if you can. Christmas night, miles and miles of endless, empty, broken white ice, an ice floe drifting somewhere in the vicinity of the 73rd parallel north of the Arctic Circle, nothing but ice, that is nearly nothing. If you look carefully through the winter night, you'll see two tiny, dark blemishes, the figures of two men, one twisted in an unconscious heap as our skipper, Jonathan Blake. The other figure, Gerald Stewart, first mate, me. It makes a good, sorry picture. Civilized men in a primitive wilderness of ice waiting helplessly for death. Aye, a sorry picture. It's a far different picture you'd have seen if you'd been a part of the excited crowd standing at the battery on the New York waterfront on a June morning, the year 1852. The moment of departure? Aye, Lady Franklin, we must take the high tide. May God and his great mercy protect you and your men from the perils which await you. The men are prepared for hardships, Lady Franklin. We shall succeed where the others have failed in ending the mystery of the Erebus and Terror. Aye, and back to Aberdeen in time for a Christmas feast. <laughs> and we'll prepare a Christmas celebration your men will never forget, Captain. We're leaving for England next week. I shall pray for you, Mr. Stewart. For all of you. Thank you, Miss Craycroft. I'll stand many a watch out at sea thinking of last night, the ball, dancing, and you. Uh, that is, all of us will, I mean. Uh, what my first mate is trying to tell your niece, Lady Franklin, is how grateful the officers and crew are for the farewell ball you held in their honor last night. I'm the grateful one, Captain Blake. Please bring them all home safely. Oh, come now, Lady Franklin, no need for why. But Jessica's a sturdy ship, and the men are in good health and lofty spirits. We'll be back by Christmas, you'll see. Uh, the tide will change. We must be on our way. Then goodbye and good luck, Captain. Goodbye, Lady Franklin. Miss Craycroft. Goodbye, Captain Blake. Goodbye, Mr. Stewart. Godspeed. Thank you. We shall see you in Aberdeen Christmas week. Let's get aboard, Mr. Stewart. Yes, sir. Bye, Lady Franklin. Starkey? Yes, sir. Drop the gangway? Yes, sir. All hands at their mooring stations, Mr. Stewart? Yes, sir. I'll then pass the orders to cast off. Aye, sir. All hands, prepare to cast off. All hands, prepare to cast off. Let go, one and two. Let go, one and two. 
Let go three and four. Let go three and four. Ship's underway, sir. Aye. Well, Mr. Stewart, fill your eyes with the sight of New York. The last of it you'll be seeing for some time to come. Aye. Good long time. I am, sir. As the Jessica moved slowly to the outer harbor, I watched a tiny, delicate white dot in the crowd at the wharf. She stood there beside Lady Franklin, waiting. And I watched until the morning fog erased the sight of the New York waterfront. Aside from the ship's log, I have decided to keep a running account of this voyage. This account will be transferred to a watertight jar and thrown into the currents should any sudden disaster occur. The first three weeks of navigating north were merely a matter of settling down to ship's routine. On June 30th, after officer's mass, we sighted Point Farewell on the Greenland coast. The time had come for the captain to read a letter of instructions given to him by Lady Franklin. <coughs> captain Blake. I'm sure you will do all that any man can in discovering the fate of my husband, Sir John Franklin, and his two ships, the Erebus and Terra. But my only fear is that you might sacrifice your lives in the unknown regions of the Arctic. Therefore, let me state that above all else, the preservation of the lives of you and your heroic companions is more important to me than the purpose of your journey. May God in his great mercy preserve you all from harm amidst the perils which await restore you to us safely and in health, as well as honor. Your sincere and attached friend, Jane Franklin. Well, these are the only written instructions I have, gentlemen. Now then, uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, the map, please. Yes, sir. Well, there it is, gentlemen, the most recent admiralty map of the Arctic regions that we are approaching. Aye. Now, it's almost completely blank. Hi, Mr. Halliday. Thousands of miles of uncharted wilderness. And somewhere in that frozen tundra, Sir John Franklin and his men vanished. Aye. Our search will begin tomorrow when we drop anchor in Godhab. We'll pick up our ice pilot, Mr. Patrick Hansen, some additional supplies, and then make for the Arctic Circle. Arctic Circle? <laughs> Sounds like the edge of the world, eh, Stuart? Yeah. A little frightening, too. You frightened? Mr. Holliday, if I were you, I'd respect Mr. Stewart's fear for what lies before us. Captain, I was just thinking. If Franklin was looking for the Northwest Passage, he'd probably make an approach through, uh, here. Through Lancaster Sound. Ah. And he must have passed Pond's Bay, uh, here. And according to our information, there are Eskimos at Pond's Bay. They might have seen his ship sent to Lancaster Sound. If they did, then we'll have something to go by. I hope Mr. Hansen understands the Eskimo dialects. They can tell us much. I don't see how we can cover all this territory and get back by Christmas, Captain. We have no choice, Mr. Stewart. If we get caught beyond the Arctic Circle after the summer months, we may never get back. Never? Aye. In the winter, the seas are covered with great ice floes. Once a ship is frozen in those latitudes, it'll stay there until the summer thaw. You can't imagine the horrors we'd endure in an Arctic winter, Mr. Halliday. Are you... I suppose not. Franklin and his men were probably frozen in for the winter. And, and they were never heard from again. Exactly. Well, that'll give you a brief idea of what went for, gentlemen. We'll know more after Mr. Hansen comes aboard. Any questions? I have nothing but questions, Captain. I wish I had the answer, Stuart. <laughs> Noon the next day, we dropped anchor in the harbor at Gotham. Here we would take on coal, additional winter clothing, dogs, and Eskimo drivers, and Mr. Hansen, our ice pilot. Gotham was nothing more than a few huts of the Baffin Bay Trading Company, and as we prepared to go ashore, a longboat suddenly appeared alongside. Captain Blake? Aye. I'm Patrick Hansen, your ice pilot, sir. We were about to send a boat ashore for you, Mr. Hansen. No time for that, Captain. But uh, we planned on picking up supplies and dogs. I brought them. They're in the boat. Well, what's the rush, Mr. Hanson? Oh, this is Gerald Stewart, my first mate. You've never been in the Arctic before, Mr. Stewart? No. Take my word for it. You better get up there while we got the summer weather, you bet. All right, so we run into a little summer ice. The Jessica's prepared for that. Yeah, she looks like good, strong ship. Hey. We've never seen iron ship up here before. 
A steam engine, too. <laughs> That's not all that Jessica has. There's additional iron plates across her hull, as well as added bracing for a chip in the far ten feet of the bow is solid iron and razor sharp at the edge. What do you think that'll do to your ice, Mr. Hanson? You wait and you see what the ice can do to a ship. Even an iron ship, Mr. Stewart. Uh, uh, Mr. Hanson, you received my letters. Yeah. And you made inquiries about the Erebus and Terra? Yeah, they was here. They couldn't get dogs, so they headed for Pawns Bay. Across Baffin Bay? That's right. Ah, uh, just as we thought. Mr. Halliday. Aye, sir. Get those supplies aboard, then prepare the ship to sea. Right away, sir. At once. Steward. Yes, sir. You can chart a course for us. We'll cross the Arctic Circle next and on to Ponds Bay. We set it north by northwest course, leaving the last outpost of civilization behind us and crossed the Great Baffin Bay. On July 4th, we crossed the Arctic Circle without ceremony. Then we had ice freezing on deck and in the rigging. A day later, we saw our first floating iceberg. For this time of year, we should not have seen either one. From Gadab to Pons Bay, six and a half days, perfect calm. Upon landing, we found a small contingent of Eskimos, but nothing else. They seemed hostile and would give us no information. Then, as we were preparing to return to the Jessica, one of the natives, a girl, rushed from one of the huts and down to the beach. Oh, oh, what's she saying, Mr. Hanson? Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, Captain, look. She has something in her hand. She wants us to look at it. Oh, it's a small brass button. From a naval uniform. Aye. Right. See if she'll trade it for some sewing needles. Ose. Galaga. Well, what does she mean by that? Ose. Yosef. She's trying to say a man's name. Ose. Galaga. Joseph Gallagher? Steward, is, is that name on Sir John's crew list? I'm uh, looking, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's here. Quartermaster Joseph Gallagher. They've been here. Aye. Uh, better get back to the ship, man. Looks like a gale brewing. Oh, sir. Oh, uh, better keep the button, Steward. Uh, give her the needles, too. Yes, sir. Oh, sir. <laughs> After leaving Pond's Bay, two months passed without incident. Then we entered Lancaster Sound and approached the scarcely charted islands along Barrow Strait. There we, we encountered great mountains of floating ice. And we had only a few hours of twilight each day. We crossed the 75th parallel and north into Wellington Channel to Bathurst Island, the last of the charted islands on my map. Then on September 10th, weather changed. Northwest gale, sleet, and heavy fog that forced us to a bare crawl, and even worse, mammoth ice flows that closed in all around us. Oh, Mr. Stewart. Yes, sir. Keep an eye on the temperature. I am, sir. Ice! Ice! Get ahead! Quartermaster, starboard six degrees. The sleets have been getting smaller all the time. Captain, the temperature is still dropping. Ten above zero. What do you think of this lead, Hanson? I think maybe they better back out of here. Back out? Take a look astern, Hanson. Back out where? Captain. Oh, what is it, Alder? The rudder will not respond. Six below, sir. I dead ahead! The lead is getting smaller, Captain. Aye, aye. Well, the Arctic seems to be closing down on us on all counts. The walls of the lead moved in closer until a man could jump to the ice from either side of the ship. And then the Jessica was cutting through the ice, making her own lead, but slowly we lost the speed. Finally, the ship gave up to the ice. He's frozen in, though. Aye. Stop engines, Mr. Stewart. Yes, sir. Well, Captain Blake, looks like they can forget about looking for Sir John Franklin in his ships. Now that we've frozen in, we're going to have to look out for our own lives, you bet. Autolite.
Wright is bringing you Mr. Joseph Cotton in Arctic Rescue. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. It was the night before Christmas, and outside the door, a man was trying his starter once more. But try as he would, the car wouldn't go, for the battery was dead. Out of water, you know. That man should have had an auto light stay full battery, Harlow. <laughs> right you are, Hap. There's the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Because the auto light stay full has over three times the liquid reserve of batteries without stay full features. And in addition, it has fiberglass retaining mats protecting every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Money just can't buy a better battery. So, friends, see your nearest Autolite battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries, and he has an Autolite stay full for your car if a replacement is needed. Just call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And I'll tell you where you can get an Autolite stay full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year. In normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Joseph Cotton in Elliot Lewis's production of Arctic Rescue, a true story well calculated to keep you in suspense. September 10th, 1852. Unless a miracle occurred, we were frozen in the Arctic for the rest of the winter months. A sea of ice surrounded us, and the ship took on a starboard list from the pressure of the flow. Rations were cut in food, water, and coal consumption. Furious gales came and went, and there were more freezing temperatures, often as low as 35 below. The doctor was a busy man. Nearly all hands suffered from frostbite, many from gangrene. Conditions aboard the Jessica were deplorable. I thought they couldn't get worse. October came, November, December, and we thought of home and the holidays and of Lady Franklin and Miss Craycroft sitting alone at the Christmas feast that was to be held in our honor. On Christmas Day, the cook outdid himself. We had a feast aboard the Jessica on the last of the salt pork and beef. And with the last of the Alsop sale and minced meat, the cook made pies. And we had us a celebration, Christmas Day, 1852. Men, men, the captain has a word to say. I, uh, drop below to offer you my greetings on this holiday and to wish you a much happier Christmas next year. Thank you. Thank you. Christmas Eve, 1853, one year later. We're still frozen in. Summer came and passed without an appreciable rise in temperature, and the ice failed to break up. Men living on pemmican occasionally ate bear meat and seal blubber. No more lime juice, this means scurvy. The year also saw the loss of 11 men, the doctor and the ice pilot Hanson among them. Two in a chase with a polar bear, three from scurvy, and the rest from gangrene. Most of the men have frostbite. Our second Christmas in the Arctic. The flow that holds the ship is drifting south down Peel Sound. We saw the shores of King William's Island. And the captain sent Halliday and three men on sledge to look for food depots or a rock cairn, anything. They returned today. Where'd you find it, Halliday? In a cairn. We also found empty pemmican cans and bits of ship's timber. Sure. Listen to this. It was written by Franklin himself. 1851, latitude 69 degrees, longitude 98 degrees west. HMS Terror sank when ice broke. Erebus still frozen in. Beset since April 12, 1850. We are deserting the Erebus. 
a tempting overland march to Backsfish River, to Hudson's Bay. If unheard from when this found, we must be considered lost. Sir John Franklin, Captain HMS Erebus. We found what we came for. Aye. They're all dead. Aye. If something doesn't happen pretty soon, we'll be dead, too. Makes for a very merry Christmas, Captain. Captain. I heard it. It's the ice. Breaking. How long do you think our iron plates will last against this, Captain? Great cracks opened in the ice. And then out of the water through the openings, another great mountain of ice would rise. Great slabs that would have been a hundred yards wide. Shattered, upended, and sank into the churning water. All around us, great jagged fingers of ice crashed up. Oh, hands abandoned! Oh, hands abandoned! Oh, Stuart, get your chops. We're going out on the ice, too. Yes, sir. I could feel the ship jarring loose under me, and suddenly the Jessica red sharply throwing me across the deck. The last sound in my ears was that of the Jessica tearing loose from the ice. <laughs> I became aware of pain in my leg, then of movement. I opened my eyes. The captain was helping me to walk. And I looked into the winter darkness for the familiar sight of the Jessica. And I saw nothing. Nothing but ice. Skipper. Huh? No feeling better, lad? What about the ship? Gone down. And the... The rest of the men. I, I don't know. Gone. The flow separated. Most of them were on the other side. Where? Where are we walking to? I don't know. I don't know. We walked on and on, climbing jagged hummocks of ice and falling through thin spots. Legs got wet, froze. Beat the ice off, and we we kept walking, walking in circles through the Arctic night, endless circles. Uh, we'll rest a bit. Ah, oh, let's rest, sleep a bit in the ice, warm, comforting ice. No, don't, don't, don't sleep. My eyes grew heavy. I craved sleep. But their sleep was to die. I was ready. In the sky over the horizon. A star. The night was overcast. There were no other stars. Just... Just one. Bright in the distance. I could see it. I... I, I stood. It was still there. A bright star over the horizon. Captain! Up! Uh, on your feet, Captain! Uh, We're going to keep walking. Walking? Where? There. That way toward that... That star. We walked on. Slowly. I carried the skipper. Unconscious now, but... Oh, what could it be? There are no lights in the Arctic, no stars through the overcast. But we kept moving, and the star came closer. I couldn't believe what suddenly appeared. Through the darkness directly beneath the star was the vague outline of a ship. A ship. Mates! Mates, help! Help me! He's coming out of it. Stuart. Uh, Stuart. A ship. I saw. Darky. Halliday. I... In the flesh. I, I saw a ship. I know. You're on it. See? But where did 
did it come from? Not the Jessica. I know. That's the Erebus, one of Franklin's ships. The one they deserted. Erebus. Where did it come from? Well, there we were. All of us. Except you and the captain lying on that flue. After the Jessica went down, ready to die just as we thought you had. And then just as graceful as you please, we see a ship drifting slowly out of the fog through the broken ice. Right to us. But the captain, I left him out on the ice. It's all right. We brought him aboard, and pretty soon we'll be on our way home. Oh. Aye. The ice is open. We can get out. The Erebus will take us back. Now, how's that for a Christmas surprise? I follow the star. What? Hmm. He's sleeping. What was that he said? He followed the star? Aye. He must have seen that lantern we hung from the mainmast and mistook it for a star. Oh. Hmm. Saved his life. Damn the captain. <laughs> well, being that it's still Christmas, I guess you could call it a uh, miracle, eh, Starkey? Aye. I guess you could at that, sir. Suspense, presented by Autolite, tonight's star, Mr. Joseph Cotton. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. They are members of the Autolite family, as well as are the 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our family also includes the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and Autolite plants in many foreign countries, as well as the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, a story from your morning newspaper. The dramatic expose of narcotics peddling among teenagers, as reported in Melody in Dreams. Our star, Mr. John Lund. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Bluskin. Arctic Rescue was written for Suspense by Gus C. Bays. Featured in tonight's cast were Joseph Kearns, Norma Varden, Lillian Bayef, Fred Mackay, Barney Phillips, Clayton Post, and Ben Wright. Joseph Cotton can currently be seen in the Burt Freed Loeb production, The Steel Trap, a 20th Century Fox release. Remember next week, John Lund in Melody in Dreams. Eight million Americans are suffering from arthritis or rheumatism. Recent medical discoveries have given these people hope of cure from this crippling disease. You can help make this hope a reality by mailing a contribution to Arthritis, care of your local postmaster. Friends, on behalf of the entire Autolite family and all of us on suspense, this is Harlow Wilcox wishing all of you a very Merry Christmas. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network.